Shalom Rastafari and Petaktov Petaktov. Good note. Good ticket. Uh, a, a good, in the sense, a good verdict. Because whole Sha'inna, the whole Sha'inna Araba, this particular day, the seventh day of Sukkot, which now we're in the cycle of um, the culmination or the ending. It's not an immediate ending because if you look at page 8 of our Sabbath house readings, and like we said before, Yah willing, we intend and hope to update this and provide some further notes and clarification so that the brothers and sisters will know exactly how to observe the, the weekly um, Shabbats or Senbets and then also the annual Shabbats or Senbets during those three times and on those seven high holy days in our Hebraic establishment and especially amongst us as the elect Rastafari. Now, as we mentioned before, and we'll mention it again here because it's an important theme, important theme of this particular season, especially with Yom Kippur and the Day of Atonement, as well as connected with the Feast of Tabernacles, or what's known as ingathering in the English, and tabernacles are literally booths, but Hebraically known as the Feast of Sukkot, is connected with judgment. This is a very interesting connection. And here, we'd like to show this right here. Now, some would say, oh, this is so-called pagan, this is heathen because it's from Egypt. But you must recall that Moses, Moshe, our Coptic Hebrew brother Moses, was learned in all the wisdom of the Egypts or Egyptians, and he was mighty in word and in deed. Now, we say that there's a connection with this and that, and with 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 ancient true ancient Egypt and the mysteries or the mysteries, the the wisdom school and the knowledge of our lawgiver and his initiation, Moshe or Moses, who wrote the Torah or the five books of Moses. That is our main and foundational reading and feeding each and every Shabbat as well as every high holy day during those three times in which all the males of the Beit Israel are to appear before Yahweh Eloheinu in the place that he appoints. Now, I want you to keep this in mind. I want you to keep this in mind and listen up, and we're going to explain, and it's going to become obvious. Now, the final judgment. What's the connection of the final judgment with the whole sha in the whole sha whole sa sa sha whole sha in raba or the great whole sha in but before we get there and before we go there let us get a metaphysical definition the esoteric definition of whole sha in whole sha in and don't confuse that with uh, Hashanah, like uh, uh, Rosh Hashanah. Hashanah and Hosha'ena is from two different. It's two different words. You might imagine that they are similar from an English perspective, but if you were to see it in the the Hebrew and the Ethiopic and pronounce it correctly, you would recognize. We don't want to say. We don't want to say Hosanna. See Hosanna is more of a feminized and a Gentile way because there's certain key letters that give it a particular sound. The ho sha ho sa or sha ho sa ho sha ho 
that Nagusul set different than just regular shat. But for now, we'll utilize a regular shat. And if you utilize a regular shat for the Nagusul, the Nagusul set, it is correct. But modern Ethiopians don't not pronounce that Nagusul set properly according to the ancients. This is something that we have to renew. We as the once lost but now found Beta Israel. So Hosha'inna. What does Hosha'inna mean? I have this um, uh, Cruden's uh, concordance. I think I, I introduced it elsewhere and before. And I put this here as a reference. And um, in this uh, Cruden's uh, concordance, under Hosha'inna, or they have Hosanna in the English way, they say Hosanna. But the more correct Hebraic way is Hosha'inna, the Hosha'inna. It's a Hebrew or Hebraic word meaning save we pray. In other words, save we pray. Now the root of Hosha'inna, Hosha'inna, is the same as the root of the name of Jesus Hebraically, which is Yeshua contracted, but in the fuller sense, Yehoshua, 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 as well as Hosea, 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 as well as Isaiah, Yeshiyayu, Yeshiyayu, Yeshiyayu. So it is key for us to understand that when we say Hosha'inna, it means say we pray. Now, we know that in the, in the manifestation of Christ, Yeshua, there was a manifestation of and a fulfillment of prophecy of him riding on the donkey. And this is another ancient type. You understand? Another ancient type and, and, and mythos that was fulfilled and is fulfilled as well. And this we'll touch on next, the, the, the mythos of riding on that donkey into Jerusalem, which the Kabur Neges gives us the Ethiopic Talmud or the background of in chapter 107. And we touched on that a little bit earlier, chapter 107 of the Kabur Neges. But now we want to define Hosanna or Hosha'inna, it's a word which means save we pray. Hosha'i, Hosha'i na. Na is the us. Hosha'i na. Hosha'i na. Hosha'i na. Save we pray. It is taken from the 118th Psalm. From the 118th Psalm and was the cry of the multitudes as they thronged in our Adonai's, or our Lord, triumphal procession into Jerusalem. So this was what, see, from a Christian perspective, that's what the Christian would know in the New Testament sense. But the real foundation for that idea is the Belui Kidan and Torah, is Torah. So we have to understand what was being fulfilled by our black Lord and Savior, Yeshua HaMoshiach. Or Jesus Christ. So from a Christian perspective, they will say, well, this is based on Psalm 118, and it was the cry of the multitudes as they thronged in our black lords and Adonai's triumphal entry into, and procession, his entry and his procession into Jerusalem. Now, this book, as we noted before, chapter 107, is very much a key. Make a note of it if you haven't already. Chapter 107, because chapter 107 that we touched on in an earlier part of this teaching is called, and it, it, it's, it's named, um, Concerning His Entrance into Jerusalem in Glory in glory, or we can say even in shock and awe, or in the Shekinah, or Shekinah, in the shock and awe, in glory, his entrance into Jerusalem. Now, in the revelation of Arastafari, we also have his majesty, 
Edomawi, Haile Selassie. So we have a father-son fulfillment. The fulfillment in the son we have in Yeshua HaMoshi, the fulfillment in the fatherhood of God we have in Edomawi, Haile Selassie. And this is another aspect of Rastafari revelation. Now, it gives a couple of quotes, um, verses. It says Matthew 21 and 9. And Matthew 21 and 15, Mark 11 and 9, and Mark 11, same chapter, verse 10, and John 12 and 13. John 12 and 13. Please make a note of that so you, you can at least get the New Testament. And see, now this is very important for us to even um, make a note of if we have a, we have a pen over here to make a note of as well. And why this is so important for us to make note of this as well is that if you look in our chart, part of the chart was um, developed based on pre-existing um, information, but then in our study of it, like we use the Wikipedia, but then as we study of it, the Holy Spirit guides and says, that's true. Here's the evidence of that. That's not true, or that's only true according to those, but look at this evidence, you know, and the Holy Spirit guides us and directs us. So here we've made a couple of notes here, and we hope to, within a month, within the next moon or so, as we would say, to have a more updated for the new year that we are in, in our Torah, that we are beginning, rather, after and on the Simchat Torah, which is about a day or two away from this particular day. And just to date this, this is October 19. So we want to um, put some of these uh, additional quotes and scriptures for, um, once again, this is Matthew. We've got Matthew 21, uh, um, verses 9 and 15. We've got Mark chapter 11, verses 9 and 10. And we got John chapter 12, verse 13, as additional quotes for the Hosha'ina, Hosha'ina, Hosha'ina Araba, for this particular um, day, right? The seventh day. Now, this is based on, this is based on the Crudens, a basic uh, Bible concordance, and we want to mark that page. Now we're going to go to the, to the, um, uh, metaphysical Bible Dictionary. As we mentioned before, we've uploaded. Um, there's a PDF um, version there, freeware, shareware. But this is a hard copy, and as one can afford it, it's good to get a, especially for, for one's household, for family, if one has children, and to teach them. And so they can also learn for themselves, as well as have the digital. But if one needs to get a digital, so that they can least study, you can go to our site, www.lojsociety.org, and you'll find that on the studies page. Now, let's go to Hosha'ina, bring up Hosha'ina. This is what I was mentioning before. This is from the Kibbutz Neges. Here you see that I call this the Ethiopic Jesus, or the Ethiopic Yesus, Yeshua. Is entering into Jerusalem. This is what uh, chapter um, 107 is all about in the Kibur Neges. Right? And now, this is very interesting because this is, we call this um, uh, prophetic because this is the Ethiopian, um, you can say Jesus, or the Ethiopian Jesus, and this was done centuries ago. And if you look at the features of the Ethiopic Jesus, the true Ethiopic Jesus, as they say, it's a, it's a dead ringer, or it's a ringer for Kedamawi Haile Selassie, for the King of Kings. And that is not an accident. You can look at it once again. That is not an accident right there. That is, that is prophetic, you know. But in spite of all this evidence, there are still many who would refuse to accept the truth of the matter. But we'll, we're going to touch on a couple of more of these um, symbolic uh, 
symbolic images in some of these plates as well. Also, we thought it was very interesting from the Ethiopic perspective. And the last one was plate um, 23. This is plate 15. And this is the virgin and child and Yosef fleeing into Egypt. Now, while we thought this was significant too, because she is also like on a, seems like a donkey or a small horse as well. And there's something to these types, you know, to these types. And they were fleeing into Egypt. And remember the prophetic, I've called my son out of Egypt, which is similar to the Beit Israel, Yahweh's son in the Belui Kidon, in the Old Covenant, in the Old Testament, being called out of Egypt as well. Now, here in the Metaphysical Bible Dictionary, we have to look under Hosanna, Hosanna but more correctly is uh, Hosha'ina. And here it says that is, um, but they, they tell you actually, what's good about the Metaphysical Bible Dictionary in the, in the, in the brackets, or the parentheses, it says GK from H-E-B. In other words, the English, that the Hosha'ina is actually the Greek. See, the Greek, they don't have the she the she sound or the sheen sound or the nugusu se or nugusu se which is she in the Ethiopic or guz they don't have that sound therefore even in iusus or iesus they could not say yeshua because they don't have a sh sound in the koina or in the greek and this is one of the reasons why those who have gotten it now from the greek perspective it may seem odd if we say it's really Hosha'ina to some Ethiopic or Ethiopian peoples because even the Ethiopian language has been, the way it's spoken, has been feminized. Linguistically, we call it feminized when masculine sounds or emphatic sounds like the the uh, the, the oin, the oin, oh, has been said like the alpha, the alpha. In other words, as been said, with less, with less emphasis, with less richness. In other words, but that's a, that's a related, but that's another point. But they tell you right here that the spelling Hosa in Na is the Greek from the Hebrew, because in the Hebrew is Hosha in Na, just like this the Ethiopic says right here, and just as His Majesty's Bible has it in this form, Hosha in Na. Hosha'ina, but Martin say Hosanna because that's the Greek from the Hebrew. But they say it means save now, deliver now, succor, succor now, be propitious, be propitious now. Now, we begin off saying that this is connected with one of the main themes of the Hosha'ina Araba and of this Sukkot in gathering is judgment is judgment now we know that in um is it zachariah zacharias at the last chapter of zachariah it also speaks that all nations will come to the feast of tabernacles and all those who don't come there will not be any rain for them so there's a rain connection and we find it interesting that here up here in the so-called east coast of um, the belly of the beast or Babylon or America where we're at, there's a storm coming in. There's a storm presently coming in. It's been raining, you could say, since the night time, but a little heavier in the morning as well. And this is like a rainy day. And there's a connection in our notes and on the wiki site with rain for this season as well. So these elementals, make note of these things because you have to make some notes. Just take it, just jot it down. Just make notes, go over the notes. The notes are not meant to be neat and all that. Just make the notes, you know, as you pick up on it, jot these things down and then go, and go over it. You know, then one can, you know, take the time of putting it, you know, into a more of a presentation, you know, saying, or putting it a little more into order. You know, saying one has to, catch certain bits and bites of information when they can, and then put it all together um, when they're able to. Now, they said this is the word that's customarily acclaimed at the Feast of Tabernacles, Hosha'ina. 
it was used by the multitude in reference to Jesus or Jesus or more correctly Yeshua or Yesus, Matthew chapter 21 verse 9. Ho Sha'ana to the son of David, blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Ho Sha'ana in the highest. The meaning is, according to one commentator named Follows, Lord Adonai, preserve this son of David, preserve this son of David. He favors and blessing, barakat, on him. Now, metaphysically, this is a worshipful prayer, metaphysically, offered by the inner thoughts that are awakened spiritually, prayer for the preservation and safe growth of the Christ spirit that is being formed and brought to birth in the soul and body of the individual. We desire every blessing and good for this true Christ ideal within us. See, this is now the metaphysical or more the esoteric. What we touched on initially was the exoteric or what happens on the outer or the more outer manifestation as it is. But then on the inner, the inner application, the inner app, is this, that this is worshipful prayer that's offered by the inner thoughts that are awakened spiritually. Prayer for the preservation and safe growth of the Christ spirit that is being formed and brought to birth in the soul and body of the individual or the indivisible dual. We desire every barakat and good. This is why we say patekatov. Every barakat and tov or melkam or good for this true Christ ideal within us, within I and I and I and I, that it may develop and take full possession to the complete putting on of the Christ, to the complete that each of us will put on Moshiach, each of us will put on Christ, Yeshua, which means redemption. This putting on of the messianic or Moshiach or Christ consciousness, it means redemption. This is, this is, see, remember, this whole season is one season. From the trumpets, which announces it, to the Day of Atonement and that fast, and the, then the seven days of ingathering in booths or tabernacling and remembering what Yahweh did for us through our ancestors, and therefore prophetically what he will do for the remnant in this present time as he is delivering us and bringing us out of everywhere he has scattered us, especially the north country. The north country for this lost sheep of the house of Israel is America. America is the obvious. North America, duh. That's prophecy. He says, no longer will we say, bless the Lord, our God, Yahai, Yahai, who delivered us out of Egypt, but that he had delivered us out of the North Country, North America, and all of the countries and all of the nations and places that he has scattered us through our ancestors. See, we're living in redemption times, you know, um, Rasta man redemption, Rastafari redemption. Understand that prophetic to it. Now, this is, this is all that's here in the Metaphysical Bible Dictionary. But my brothers and sisters, study it. If, you, if you're able to study it, we, we, there's more that we want to touch on right now, so we're not going to spend um, a whole lot of time going into the breaking down each line and each meaning. But there's much meaning in it because the main thing is how does this benefit us spiritually, each of us, each of us should and must benefit and receive this. See, when each of us receive this, this is part of the discipline and discipleship process where each individual must take personal responsibility. So if each of us as individuals take that sort of 
due diligence and personal responsibility than when Yahweh make a way for I and I and I to gather together. You know what I'm saying? What, what, a, what, what a gathering. I think, I'm thinking of the more we are together, you know, together, together, you know. Um, what a greater fellowship this will be. So the individual, each of us must take that personal responsibility. And this is all part of discipleship. So those who have asked about discipleship, you know what I'm saying, um, discipleship begins by paying attention and by making one's will or being to good influences and receiving that sort of instruction. You know, this, and the Torah portion readings as well as the, the holy days and times, understanding the meanings of the holy days. What do they mean? This is why, this is what the second, third, or, or the fourth part of what we've been recording here on the whole shot in the Rabbah, excuse me, but it's important for us to go through such diligence, such due diligence, because much that we've lost, and there's much that we must learn and much that we must reclaim. And we, it's good for us to take this step by step since this is the time of the whole Sha'ina Araba. Then Kazi Bukhala, after this, is the Shemeni Atzavit, or the, or the, eighth, the eighth day, that, that great congregation on the eighth day. Then is the Simchat Torah. And here is where we read both the 54th portion, where the end of the year, in the sense in the reading, and the beginning of the year, it joins. And that takes place on the Simchat Torah, which is, as we said and been saying, is only a couple of days away. So, brothers and sisters, if you're already in, in the Genesis Torah portion readings, you're going a little bit ahead, but you know that, that's that's no that's no problem about that. So if you love the word as I and I love the word, then Yahweh loves you and Yeshua. You understand? He saves you as He saves I and I. But we must put on Christ. You see, because it's a spiritual. You understand? It's a it's it's it's, it's, it's a it's a it's a mental ascent that we must make initially where it says don't be conformed to the world but be transformed by the what? Renewing of your minds. So stay tuned as we go into more of the, the, the theme which is the final judgment as well as touch on more of the meaning of the greeting that is often greeted by Hebrews and, and Jews on this particular day. Some say Piska Piska Tov. Some say Pitka Tov. More correctly we will say Patek Tov. Patek Tov. And it means a good note. In fact, if we still have I think we still have uh, some time, let's let's go into this this right here. At least to lay a foundation. We might go over this again if necessary. If you recall we made a connection, or we, we, we introduced evidence. We haven't made that connection just yet. And this is from E.A. Wallace Budge's book, and this right here is portion of the judgment scene. This is portion of the ancient Egyptian judgment scene of, of, of uh, Osar or Osiris on that throne in that judgment scene. Now, um, this is the other book that has the to pull out the more extended view of it. Now listen to this. Check it out on Wikipedia and, and look up the key words. The key word here, the, the kital, but we haven't gotten up to that just as of yet. Now, Hosha'ina Araba is known as the, the last of the days of judgment. This seventh day is the last of the days of judgment, which began on Rosh Hasana. As we said, Hasana and Ho Sha'ina are not cognates. In other words, they're not related one to the other. That's just imagined from a non Hebraic or a non literate of the Shemitic languages. It seems so from an English perspective, but they're not cognates. But these are the last days of judgment. 
Now, according to the Jewish Zohar, it says that while the judgment for the new year is sealed on Yom Kippur, it is not delivered until the end of Sukkot. So the Yom Kippur, which is a, which is a high holy day and a fast, and a fast day, let's move this over here, and, and a fast day, and a day of atonement, and also a day of, of, of judgment. It says that while the judgment for the new year is sealed up on Yom Kippur, it is not, quote, delivered, and to say, carried out until the end of the Sukkot. And the end of the Sukkot is this particular day or the whole Sha'ina Rabbah, the last day of Sukkot, the last day of Sukkot. Remember the beginning and the ending. The beginning and the ending is very important with Yahweh, and it's very important, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the Aleph Tav, in the sense of the beginning and the ending, uh, Saturday, Shabbat, the seventh day, and Sunday, or Ehud, the first day, the beginning and the ending. Now, this is, this, this uh, end of Sukkot, the Hosha'ena Rabbah, the last day of Sukkot, during which time one can still alter the verdict and the decree for the new year. The, the, the verdict and the decree still can be altered, as it were. Consequently, the Baraket, which Hebrews and, and OJs, other Jews, um, give each other on the whole Sha'ina Araba is Piskatov, or Piska, Piskatova, Piskatova, or we will say Patek or Fetek, Fetek Tob. In the Yiddish, for those OJs or other Jews, they also say Aguten Kvetel, 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 Aguten Kvetel, a good Kvetel or a good note, a good note, which is a, a, a wish that the verdict will be positive. So this is one of the reasons why when we began off before we had mentioned Petekotov, Petekotov, because that, that would be more or less the greeting, for lack of a better uh, descriptor, the greeting. Now, in this spirit, in this spirit, the cantor or the one who would chant, the cantor or the chanter, the chanter, wears what is known as a kittel, a kittel, as on high holy days. Now, when I saw this and I read this, I said, Kittel, it sounds kind of familiar, but I don't really know what a Kittel is. So let me do the wise thing. Let me look it up. So that's what I did. I looked up Kittel. And this is where I have to share this. Because first I was thinking to actually the inspiration came, make the connection. You understand? With ancient Egypt, with this. The judgment scene, the judgment scene. You know? And... Then I said, well, maybe I need to explain part of that first, so forth and so on. But after I looked up Kittel, and now Kittel, let's bring that up, Kittel, a Kittel, also Kittel, it could be spelled K-I-T-T-E-L or K-I-T-L. Now, or Kittel, it can also be pronounced Kittel, Ki, because it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a Kofiod, is a kofio the tel the kital the kital. It's a robe or coat. Now, um, in the German, kital is house or work coat. Now, this is a robe or a more correctly a white robe which serves. Now, get this. It's a white robe which serves. Guess what it serves as? It serves as a burial shroud a burial shroud for male Hebrews and male Jews. So let's, let, 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 let's, let's rewind this for a moment. Right? Remember, Moses was learned in all the wisdom of the Egypts, and he was mighty in word and deed, and he's the author of these five books that we know as the Torah in the Hebrew and the Orit in Ethiopic. Now, in this spirit, understanding the spirit of the judgment, of the time of judgment, the last day, 
of the judgment, the cantor or the one who would be the chanter wears a kitel or a kitel as on high holidays since Hoshana Rabba, it blends elements of the high holy days, the Chola Hamaod and the Yom Tov or Bamarinya Melkam Ken. In this spirit, the cantor in the now, now, according to the Ashkenazi uh, tradition, recites the service using High Holy Day festival, weekday, and Sabbath melodies interchangeably. Because, you know, there's different melodies, whether it's a High Holy Day, it's a particular melody. It's similar to in the Ethiopic um, church, there's the three modes of chanting, G'uz, uh, Izil and Arare and Ararai. There's certain modes and uh, there's other Digwa type of modes. Well, in the Hebraic or Belui Kidan or Old Covenant, there was also these different melodies for High Holy Days, for festival, for a regular weekday, or even for Sabbath. There are melodies. Now, but on this particular day, according to the Ashkenazi tradition, they basically blend these different, um, these different melodies or styles of, of chanting or incanting. Now, among the Sephardi or the Spanish Jews, the Spanish Jews, prayers that is known as uh, selechot, uh, the selechot, which means forgiveness, are recited before the regular morning service. These are the same prayers recited before Rosh Hashanah. In the different prayers of this day, now the Syrian, the Syrian Jews, they pray in the same makam, the same makam, the makam is the melody, as on the high holy days. Now in Amsterdam and in a few places in England, America, and elsewhere, the shofar, the, the, the ram's horn, the shofar is also sounded in connection with the procession. Now, you remember in our Ethiopic Talmud, which is this, the Queen of Sheba and only son Minyalik, or the Kibber and the Guest, just returning to page, it was 209, and the chapter is 107. It says this one, quoting David, um, it says, Thus David, his father, the father of Solomon, prophesied and said, Blow ye the horn in Zion, in Zion, on the day of the new moon, on the appointed day of our festival. For it is an ordinance or a statute for Israel. So we have the... The, the connection with the horn in our Ethiopian or Ethiopic Hebrew establishment as preserved in the Kibber Neges and now available in this edition from the Line of Jew Society. And this is the Queen of Sheba and the Son Minulik. But we utilize this book now as we are growing and as we are studying. We use, utilize it as our Ethiopic Talmud because they have their sources and references. And we also have our sources, resources, and references as well. But now, the later practice, there's latter practices, there's other practices, that it reflects the idea that the Hoshana Rabba is the end of the high holy day season. Now, in, in, among latter day Jews, it's just basically the idea that, well, this is the end of the high holy day season, when the world is judged for the coming year, for the coming year. So the end of the old, a judgment for the coming year. Now because um, Hoshana Rabba is also linked to the high holy days or holidays as well as being a joy-filled day, some of the Hasidic or the Hasidim, the, Has the Hasidim communities such as the Satmar, the Satmar Jews, have the custom of having Burkhata 
kohanim, or priestly blessings recited during the, the Musaf prayer. Some communities, such as the, the Bobov, sound like Bobo, right? But the Bobov is among the European Jews. The Bobov will only do this if it is on Friday. However, this practice is not um, is not generally is not generally done. Now, here's here's an interesting, very interesting connection. And and first of all, is the evening. We've missed it this year, but hopefully in future years we'll learn it this time and we'll be able to fellowship next time, y'all willing. But the evening prior to the whole shot in the Rabbah, it is customary to read the whole Tehillim. The Tehillim is the Psalms. The Mezmur Dawit, the Ibrahist Qanqa is called the Tehillim. On the whole shot in the Rabba Eve, the Eve of the Hosha'ina. There is also a custom to read, there is also a custom to read the book of the Orit Zedagam or Devarim, which is Deuteronomy, on the night of Hosha'ina Rabba. Now, let's just rewind a little bit because they made a point here in the wiki page. And now they're basically moving on to summarize other, like here it says, rituals and customs, the reasons for many of the customs of the day. Check this out. They say the reasons for many of the customs of the day are rooted in Kabbalah. That means it's rooted in the more esoterical, you understand, the esoteric metaphysical, uh, the mishtia, the mysteries, the wisdom school, even the mythology, the mythological, because mythology, myth is really just verbal hieroglyphics. But the key about it is the interpretation. And this is where the Kabbalah or Kabbalah comes in to receive. And we pointed that out before as well. There is much of that Kabbalistic wisdom from our own Ethiopic and black Hebrew perspective in the Queen of Sheba and her only son, Minulik. So I just saw that right there, and I said, let me just just make that connection because I'm going to go back to this idea, go forward to this idea. You remember when he said that the priest or the cantor, the cantor wears a kutel, the one who chants wears a kutel, and then we looked up what kutel is, and they say that a kutel is a white robe which serves as a burial shroud for male Hebrews. Now, think of how interesting this is, because when Yehoshua, our black Lord and Savior, resurrected, that shroud allegedly was said to be left behind. You know, and then think about the connection with ancient Egypt. You see, so when we saw that word kutel, we were going to do like, sometimes a lot of y'all may do, and occasionally we do it too, where we see something and say, oh, I don't know what that means. That's probably such and such. Instead of looking it up, instead of looking it up and just finding it out, and after all, on the Wikipedia and, and some of the Internet sites, all you have to do is click the link, and the link will take you, it'll take you right to, to the page that's already out there. So the Kutel, the whole idea about the Kutel is like a burial shroud. Basically, the kutel, or what they call the sarganes, is used as a burial shroud providing simple dress that assures equality for all in death because Jewish or Hebraic law dictates that the dead are buried without anything in the coffin other than simple linen clothes. A kutel has no pockets. The kutel doesn't have any pockets. Now, we learned that the kutel is also worn by married men on Yom Kippur and in some instances on the Rosh Hashanah. The wearing of a kutel on the high holy days is symbolically linked to its use, symbolically. Notice what they're saying, symbolically. They could have said mythologically, but they chose to say symbolically. They could have said parabolically or hieroglyphically, but they chose to use 
symbolically. They could have said proverbially, but they chose symbolically. So the, so the kutta, this white robe or burial shroud, it is a symbol that is worn on the high holy days, Yom Kippur, and on Rosh Hashanah. Now they say the wearing of a kutta on the high holy days is symbolically linked to its use as a burial shroud. And to the verse, there's a verse from Yeshayahu, Yeshayahu, Isaiah, 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 our sins shall be made white as snow. In other words, pure white linen, robe, garments, so forth and so on. Now, this basically now links us to the very ancient, especially when we talk about Osar, you understand? And then when we talk about the judgment hall. It's very interesting. Cause remember, it says that Yahweh, he was married in, in the Bible. Not we say this, but the scripture says Yahweh uh, is Rael, the northern kingdom, um, and Judah, Yehuda, they were as his two wives. Now, look at he who sits on the throne right here, and behind him are these two particular women. Now, in different in different um, in different wall paintings and and art art and facts, you will see the different clothing portrayed differently. Here's a little bit different, has a little a, a little design, but elsewhere it's shown that the Egyptians already had a prior process of doing this. In fact, the Hebrew order, being a Hebrew, they say Abraham was the first Hebrew. Abraham was not the first Hebrew. There was already an order of priests in ancient Egypt, Kemet, who were known as the Hebrews. But Abraham had become initiate in that particular order, and it would be through him that the order would be preserved and would be carried on. And this is the key because the Hebrew, they were, were we could say, Yahweh, or they were worshipers of Jah, or the, the, what we say, the God of the Israelites. But God was God before he became God of the Israelites. You know, you just got to make a note of that and not get um, caught up by the OJs, the hype of the OJs. But many um, Hebrews and OJs, other Jews, also wear a kutel when leading the Passover Seder. They also wear a kutel when they're leading the Passover Seder or the Fasika, the Fasika meal. In some communities, the cantor wears it during certain special services during the year, such as the first night of Selechot, the seventh day of the holiday of Sukkot, also known, and this is this day, known as the Hosha'ina Araba, the Musaf prayers of Shemeni Ataret, and that is the next day. The next day, the eighth day, is the Shemeni Ataret. Um, and the first day of Fasika or Pesach, Passover, where the prayers for rain, or the uh, Tefillat HaGeshem, and do the Tefillat HaTal, are respectively recited. According to many traditions, a bridegroom wears a kittel. He wears a kittel on his wedding day. Now, they say that white, symbolically, uh, as a color, is said to symbolize purity in the sense of cleanness. And one need to not be conformed to the world. Because if you conform to the world and you hear someone says white is symbol of purity, people get into white supremacy and white racism, that has really warped people's sense of understanding of even simple things. So the white color is symbolic of purity or cleanness, and this has nothing to do with white people or white folks or 
white supremacy, which partly explains its use, symbolically the color white, at weddings. It is also felt to signify the unity with the bride, who also wears white, and the beginning of a new life together. Another reason worn at the wedding is because it has no pockets. It does not have any pockets, showing that the couple is marrying for love, not for what they possess. You know, whereas you're just showing up without. And, and it's very interesting when we think about the fact that the whole shot in the Araba is connected with judgment. And then the cantor or the chanter wears a kutum, which is basically a linen type of white burial robe or burial um, garment. It's interesting that these would be um, connected. Now, as we move forward, we'll, we want to address the seven um, Hoshanot because modern day observance of the rituals of Hoshanarabah are reminiscent, they say, of the practices that existed in the times of the Beta, the Beta Mechdes, or the, the Holy Temple in Jerusalem. During Sukkot, the four species, the four species, if you recall, in Leviticus chapter 23, verse 40, and ye shall take you on the first day the bowls of goodly trees, branches of palm trees, and bowls of thick trees, and willows, willows of the brook. You know that psalm that speaks about um, by the rivers of Babylon? And it says, we hung our harps up on the willows in the brook. Now, during Sukkot, the four species are taken in a circuit. These four species, these four kinds of the, the bowls of goodly trees, palm trees, thick trees, and willows of the brook, these four species are taken in a circuit, a circuit inscribing the perimeter, not circumscribing the actual building, if you can understand, the, inscribing the perimeter, not circumscribing, inscribing, not circumscribing. Um, and this is done around the synagogue or the mikorah, once daily, we can say around the Beta Rastafari, the Beta Christian, the church. Now, on Hoshana Araba, there are seven circuits. There are seven circuits. Making a circuit, a circle, a cipher around the reading desk, around the reading desk, or what they call, um, I think it's the Bima, the Bima. On Sukkot, while each person holds the four species in his hands, has its origin in the temple, the Beta Mekdes service. As recorded in the Mishnah, quote, it was customary to make one procession around the altar on each day of Sukkot, and seven on the seventh day, according to the Mishnah named Sukkah 4 and 5. The priest carry the palm branches or willows in their hands. The entire ceremony is to demonstrate rejoicing and gratitude for a blessed and fruitful year. Because remember, Sukkot takes place at the end of the year when one has gathered in, you understand, when one has gathered in their harvest. One has get, remember, there, there is a, there is a, there's two basic harvests. There's the first and there's the latter harvest. Just like there's the two rains. There are the first and there are, there are the latter rains. So now, this better helps us to understand the significance of our black Lord and Savior, Yeshua HaMoshiach, or Jesus Christ, Jesus Christos, when he rode on that donkey into Jerusalem, and they would take their, they took their clothing off, put it down, and they also had the palm branches, and they said, Hosha'ina. They said, Hosha'ina to Jesus Christos. And then the priests were very upset with that. It's a very interesting scene, and hopefully we'll have the opportunity to touch on it. But this is, this is, this is the foundation. 
So, moreover, it serves to tear down this 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 holy day and this time, the whole shot in the Rabbah. It helps to it helps to tear tear down the iron wall, the iron wall, right? There's an iron wall that separates us, I and I, from our father, Abinu Shabbat Shemayim, um, uh, Abinu uh, um, Abuna Shabbat Shemayim, or, or, or uh, Abuna Zebe Samayat. Shabbat Shemayim is the Hebrew. Uh, Zebe Samayat is the Ethiopic. Our father, who art in heaven, as the wall of Jericho, was encompassed, quote, and the wall fell down flat, and the wall fell down flat. You see, we talk about Babylon fall and overcoming our hateful enemies, but if we would make our wills obedient to good influences and to avoid evil and to, to learn his will you know, and to do his will, Babylon would have already fallen a long time ago, but still there is an opportunity for us. And this is why this ministry and this time that we have, brothers and sisters, is so very important. But Joshua, Joshua, um, chapter, Joshua 6 speaks on that. Furthermore, furthermore, the seven circuits, the seven ciphers, the seven circuits correspond to the seven words that they say are in the verse Psalm 26 and 6 or Erhat Benikayona Kapai Veraso Veva et Mizabahabaka Hashem or they say I wash my hands in purity and circle around your altar O Lord so Psalms 20 Psalms 26, Psalms 26 and, and 6, Psalm 26 and 6, let's just, we're just curious about, about something, let's go to Psalm 26 and 26 and 6, which will be this particular this particular is a 26 and 6. Um, this particular verse right here. Uh, and you see, I wash my hands in purity and circle around. Okay, 26 and 6 and circle around your altar. Ijochina be nitshina at balo avetu. Here we have one, two, three, four, five, six, but then if you count the, the um, we have six right here, but this is only a part, this is only part of a, this is only part of a verse. We'll look at the good is, but this is my hands, benitsina. In innocency, at balo, I've washed at their too. O father, his father, father of the house, I met Sewiyahin, your Mesewiya, your altar, is Oralo. So you see these areas in the scripture where we'll read, you know, like I wash my hands in purity and circle around your altar, O Yah, O, o, o Adonai, actually. Um, they have a reference. Now, each of the each of the the whole Sha'inaz, according to Judaism and from a Hebraic interpretation and practice, is done in honor of a particular a particular patriarch. Each 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 one of the circles is done in a, in the honor of a particular of a particular um, patriarch, and the seven patriarchs. That are thus thus honored are Abraham, Yishak, Yaakov, Musa, and they say that Musa or Moshe, the most important Hebrew prophet, no doubt, 
Aaron or Haram, Yosef, Joseph, and David or Dawit or David. Now for Aaron, they say Moses' brother, he was the first uh, Kohen uh, Ha Gadol or Kohen Gadol, a high priest. Yosef, Joseph, the three patriarchs and Jacob's Yaakov's most famous son, and David or great King David, the most important king of Israel. And the seven circuits, each one is done in honor of each of these, our ancestors and the Hebrew patriarchs. So stay tuned, my brothers and sisters. More to come. Shalom, Rastafari, and Patekotov. A good note.